welcome everyone. Okay, what I will do, I will start uh, introduce um, Manisha because I know she will um, she will give a lot of information. So we we need all the time. So um, I will just tell a little bit about Manisha. Manisha has worked as a herbalist and an acupuncturist for more than thirty six years. And she was introduced to light medicine in 2011, since incorporating many varied uh, light therapeutics, including the monochrome dome, near infrared sauna, or no, near infrared therapy, sensora, brain entrainments, and frequency based color puncture in the clinical practice to help people attain peaceful, balanced mind states. She works in Fremantle in Western Australia, and in 2016, she co-founded the Australasian Light Association. I'm very sure that you will enjoy this presentation, especially because Manisha has a wealth of information to share. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, in the chat box, and Manisha will then um, answer these questions at the end of the presentation. So welcome, Anisha, and I hand over the microphone to you. Thank you so much, Thelma. That's great. I'm just going to mention that I've had a few little blackouts with the internet, So, um, but we've got good audio and we've got the slides working. So I'm going to launch off straight away. As, you, as Thelma said, I've got lots of information to share with you. So... So today, what I'd like to share with you is, first of all, a little bit of a discussion about our biofield. And then, of course, that leads to discussing biophotons. And um, then I'll be launching into actually methods to measure our body light and a GDV camera session in action, which I've pre-recorded. That's a little video, which you'll be able to watch. Um, during the presentation, and I'll finish it off with the case examples using the GDV camera, which to me is probably the most exciting. It's the hands-on. So let's launch in straight away. So I dug up a definition of the biofield by Dr. Beverly Rubick, and Dr. Beverly has a PhD in biophysics, and she's well known for her work in researching the, the human biofield. So she says, the human body emits low level light, heat, acoustical energy, ele has electrical and magnetic properties, and may also transduce energy that cannot easily be defined by physics and chemistry. All of these emissions are part of the human energy field also called the biologic field or the biofield. So what she's actually saying is that our body emits light, heat, sound, electricity, and magnetism. And part of those emissions are transduced, which means they transform or change into a different form of energy that science is still trying to perceive or, or be able to measure. And I take that to be maybe she's talking about consciousness. So let's have a look at the bio, measuring the biofield. Medicine has already acknowledged quite a few um, ways to measure the biofield. And of course, we all know about EEGs, which measure the electricity of the brain, the brain waves, it's very commonly known. And the ECG, the electrocardiogram, which me measures the electricity of the heart. Of course, it can tell us if there's something out of place. And then magnetism. There's a um, something called the SQUID. The SQUID stands for Superconducting Quantum Interference Device. It's a very sensitive magnetometer used to measure extremely subtle magnetic fields. And I know of Dr. Gary Schwartz, who does a lot of research in um, energy fields. He's in Arizona and he used a squid quite often for a lot of his experiments just to assess the really subtle changes in magnetism in the body. 
And then, of course, there's heat. And this is a fantastic method of assessment, but unfortunately, it's not really um, being used to its maximum, what I think it should be used as much. It's also called thermal imaging or um, thermography. And so our body puts out infrared heat and it's measured by a certain camera. And originally this was used so that, um, well, it was used a lot for the application of pre-identifying any problem areas in the breast that could lead to cancer. However, it's also used for lots of other conditions. And as you can see in this photograph, there's an area on the left breast, which is very white. And that's a sign that there's really high temperature. And basically what they look for is um, the lack of symmetry when there's an unusual um, lack of coherence in the whole signature or the photograph of the thermal imaging. It's pointing to something that's wrong or an unhealthy situation. And in this certain situation, um, of course, if there's lots of heat, there's lots of tiny little capillaries that a lot of blood flow. And of course, we know with cancer, cancer has lots of tiny little capillaries that are a problem um, and grow massively. I'm just going to take off my headphones because they're annoying me. I think I can still do a good job without them. Just excuse me for a second. Thank you. The next one is bioacoustics. It's sound that comes from our body. Now, not many people realise, but our body does emit sound. And this particular woman, her name's Shari Edwards, I came across her work. She's a Director of Research and Development at the Institute of Bioacoustic Biology and Sound Health. When she was young, she had an extraordinary ability. She lived up, lived in the country and uh, was with a lot of animals. And she found that she was actually able to perceive and hear very subtle sounds coming from animals and humans. And she realized that it was an unusual, unique ability and nobody else seemed to have that. So she kept her secret to herself. She never really used it until later in life, her daughter, suffered a, a near fatal accident and what happened she could hear certain sound vibrations coming from her daughter's body and she used those sound vibrations to reflect back towards she sang these sounds to her daughter and she maintains that it was the thing that actually kept her alive but in any case, she's doing phenomenal work. She also trains people. And what she does now is she's translated it into um, a computerized system. And she teaches people the art of voice analysis. She measures the frequencies that are low or non-existent in a human voice or the frequencies that are uh, too much of them. And from that, she reflects certain tones back to the human body. She has phenomenal success with all sorts of really difficult things to treat. I'm just going to mention here too that on my very last slide, I've made a list of resources and references. And I've got Shari's um, reference link there. And I've also made this whole slideshow into a PDF so that if anyone at the end of this talk wants to have a copy of that, just let me know and I'll send it off to you. So that's sound. And I couldn't help myself, but I threw in this because I came across a fantastic um, talk interview with a Karen Elkins. I've put this also in the resource page. She interviewed um, Abraham Sorondo. He developed a technique, a unique technique that no one else had ever done where he could um, show the crystallization of the electromagnetic fields that were coming, being emitted from human hair. And he was actually showing that the human hair sends out signals and then it takes it back in. So it's, it's like a transmitter 
and also a receiver in waves. And these little slides that I've got here, they're actually small screenshots from the video footage that he's put out. It's really fascinating to watch. And this is quite curious because the Hopi Indians um, some time ago, they were enlisted by the military to be uh, trackers for the military. And when they were employed, they, of course, joining the military, they had to have all their hair shorn off, yeah, cut off, very short. And what they discovered was that they they lost their ability to be a tracker, to be able to have that um, ability to perceive these subtle um, signals from nature. And they worked out later on it was actually the hair. The hair was like, acting like a human antenna. And without that, they weren't able to do their job properly. So that's another spin on basically our beautiful human body, what it does, emitting, transmitting, receiving signals. And then, of course, there are biophotons. It's light. And that's the big thing that we'll be studying today. It's also known as ultra-weak photon emissions. Uh, this photograph here is um, one of the photographs that Van Wick did with um, something called a photo multipliers. And it's, it shows basically distribution of different parts of the body emitting light. So biophotons were first discovered by Russian Alexander Gurwich, which you probably all know about way back in 1922. And then further to that, um, Alex Fri Fritz Pop, sorry, <laughs> Albert Pop, um, took this to another level. That's a whole interesting story within itself, Albert's life. And then further to that, um, other researchers, for example, Mark Bishop, who's from Germany, um, is part of the research of the biophotons. So biophotons emit a fairly even distribution of the light wavelengths that goes all the way from 260 nanometers, way down in the violet range, up to 800 nanometers, which goes way beyond the red into the near infrared range. So light coming from bio biophotons is very coherent. It's a little bit like a laser, so it's very organized. And they've also discovered that uh, these biophotons are really important to us because they can replicate uh, in environments that are op opaque. In other words, in living cell tissue, it has the ability to regenerate tissue. So that's really very important. And the biophotons, they, I don't know how they worked this out, but the biophotons, there's approximately one to a hundred of these tiny, tiny little packets or particles of light per square or cubic centimeter. So it's really hard to see. And it equates to approximately the amount of light that you would see if you were looking at a candle from about 20 kilometers away. So. I don't think many people would be able to see that. The other curious thing about biophotons is that the DNA and other protein spirals, which we have many of, seem to breathe in and breathe out this light. It's almost as if they um, eject light and then bring it back in. It's a little bit like a spiraling galaxy which blasts out energy from its core. And yeah, this is very curious because again and again, we see in nature that there's a, a replica of the same patterns on a microcosm to a, a macrocosm. So according to Pop and Rattemeyer, electromagnetic waves are one and the same thing as light and photons. They don't separate the two. And light is thought to be responsible for communication within the body. And Pop also suggested that biophotons are both created and stored in the DNA. Coming back to Dr. Gary Schwartz, 
he was the gentleman in Arizona who does lots of research in energy fields. He did an experiment with um, geranium leaves and he was able to perceive or see that there were these tiny little packets of light that was that was moving from one leaf to another and they weren't just going one direction they were going both directions and he watched them for about a two-hour period and he concluded from that that there was almost like a type of communication that was going on between the leaves and he went on to to say that possibly all of nature animals plant kingdom humans and star systems all do their communication via these little bundles or packets of light. Just before I move into this, I was just going to mention also about the biophotons. Um, in our own body, <clears throat> we have um, the bulk of our photons or light <coughs> being emitted um, on our face and on our head and also on the palms of our hands. And actually the fingertips or the, um, the fingernails are extremely high in photon emissions, as is our cheeks, which is really curious. And it's also thought that um, these biophotons go through certain um, cycles of emissions. So this is Van Wick's work. He did lots of work with studying uh, the natural emissions of our biophotons. And he found that um, at certain times of the day, the biophoton emissions are stronger. So first thing in the morning, our, uh, our emissions were actually quite low. And then they would start to rise by about one o'clock. And then by 4 p.m., we had reached our maximum emissions. And what he found, which I find really curious, is um, if any of you know about our cortisol um, secretions, cortisol's a hormone from the adrenal glands. Cortisol starts off in the beginning um, very high in the morning and then gradually goes down, 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 and it's at its lowest around 4 p.m. and through the night. So what they found was that this light emission had an inverse relationship to the cortisol levels. In other words, when cortisol's high, the light emissions are low. And that's really curious too, because when a person's got really high cortisol, they're thought to be stressed. And in my measurements, um, and also in Van Wicks, they also found that when a person's stressed, they're not emitting very much light. I'll show you examples of this a bit later on. So that's really curious. And the other thing about photons is that there's seasonal changes. And, um, yeah, there's even thought that possibly our biophoton cycles relates to our circadian rhythm and cycles. So that's really curious. There needs to be more research done on that, but it's absolutely fascinating area. So getting to this slide here, I wanted to mention what your field, my field is. Um, basically what I wanted to say is that our field extends a fair distance from our body. I had a teacher who, um, a spiritual teacher who used to always get us to put our arm right out and he would say, the very tips of our fingers is the edge of our energy field. However, I think that certain people might have a much, much, much bigger field with much more subtle emanations. Um, but if you think about that and we're close to a person or we're in the proximity or in a room with lots of people, we're intermingling. Our field is intermingling with another person's field. And that goes, I, I would like to include thoughts and emotions to be part of our field or our consciousness. So really, if you think about it, when we're in close proximity with people, we're really receiving and taking in. Um, a part of the, the, that person's um, energy, their thoughts, their feelings. We're highly in, influenced by them. And of course, electromagnetic fields, they're everywhere, particularly in the city. So that's the other thing that's influencing our energy field all the time, particularly if we're holding a phone or it's within our, you know, within arm's reach of us. Um, it, basically, our energy field is being affected greatly by that. 
So I wanted to bring up this note and it's, it's all about what comes first. Now, most people think that our body emits all this energy, but what if it's our energy and information which is creating the matter? In other words, it's the other way around. Instead of our matter uh, producing the energy, it's the energy producing the matter. And I personally, I think that it's the energy precedes matter. And I just wanted to give you just a couple of examples of um, how we can more or less validate that. And Robert Becker, uh, he did, uh, he wrote the book, uh, The Body Electric. He, I think he was a neurosurgeon or in any case, he did a lot. He was famous for his experiments unfortunately cutting up salamanders or just taking their their limbs or their tails off. And what he would do, he would alter the electric field or the voltage at the site of the wound. And when he did that, he was able to determine what would grow back, whether it was a limb or whether it was a tail. Um, so in this case, definitely the energy or the electricity preceded the matter. And I also wanted to just tell you about this book, um, a gentleman, Doug Voigt. Um, you can find a lot of his information on YouTube. Um, but he's written this great little book called Multidimensional Reality. And he's also um, very much backing the idea that information and energy precedes the physical world. He explains things in really simplistic terms. So it's, it's, um, it's a very small book and I highly recommend that book for anyone who's interested in that field. And finally, the other example is a personal example that I wanted to bring up. Um, the same teacher, I'll mention who it is. It's, um, Ramtha. Ramtha was a channeled being from Jay-Z Knight and I no longer um, follow his teachings, but in the days I did, he used to talk a lot about um, a formula and it's C plus E equals R. And he used to say, in the future, this formula will be highly significant in our society, in our world. And so it stands for consciousness and energy creates reality. And you could say instead of consciousness you could say information and we used to do a really dynamic meditation you can actually see where the um the, the mudra hand position in that photograph um and a whole room of people would be blindfolded we would do imagery and very dynamic breathing techniques and we would focus very strong on our outcome our desired um thing that we were wanting to achieve is a really fantastic process but um and we used to get all sorts of incredible results doing this but i wanted to bring that up too because that's um and i'll be referring back to this a little bit later in our uh, case examples and also just to validate um this whole um thing of energy coming before before matter um it's a personal account of my own, and I'm sure you're all familiar with um, astral experiences. I think we all have them more so when we're young, but I had um, an astral experience about 10 years ago where I was laying down in my bed. I could feel my body starting to um, vibrate, and then I could feel myself moving out of my body and my arm went straight through the wall that was beside me. It was an energetic light type of arm that was going through a non-physical wall. And then I was standing outside and I was looking and observing my environment. And what I could see was everything, everything, all nature, everything was in a state of um, vibration. Everything was vibrating and I could see quite clearly it was doing that. But as I observed it, it became faster and faster and faster, this vibration, until it, it appeared that it was physical and it wasn't vibrating. And I had this sudden um, insight that all of life is really energy vibrating at a, a very great speed that we can't actually perceive that it's vibrating anymore, but it gives us the illusion that it's actually a, a physical matter. So I've, I've kept that in my mind and heart and soul because um, I really do think that our world is mostly made up of energy. And um, so... 
there's a personal account. So why would we bother measuring our light? So there's a few reasons why. First of all, the emotions are in the, more in the realm of energy. So we can get quite a bit of information about emotions. In fact, emotions can be translated to mean energy in motion. I'll get back to this later. You'll see when I give the examples. Um, as I said, it's often the energy which is a precursor to the physicality. So if we know what's going on in our light field, our energy field, it's a warning of what may come if we don't change things. It can give us insight into problems that we don't even know about, unseen problems. It's excellent for experimentation, which you'll see. I'll, um, in my case, examples later. And of course, for feedback, if we're doing uh, some sort of therapy and we want to know what's going on, um, is this beneficial? Is this activity beneficial for this particular person? It'll give us really good feedback. So when it comes to measuring our light, as far as I know, there are two major branches or categories or, or methods in which you can me measure your light emissions. And I call it the, um, one of them is the natural emissions and the other one is the forced emissions. And natural, I brought up a little bit earlier on, it was um, where we have photomultipliers. That's, um, it's very sophisticated equipment um, highly sensitive in very cool and very dark uh, environments, we can pick up the ambient natural emissions of these biophotons. And it was the work that Roland Van Wyck did a lot of work with. And on the left there that on that slide, you can see um, there's some of the photographs of the natural emissions of our body. However, the other way, the forced way, because the natural way is not that easy for the lay person or to do. So the forced way relies upon um, something called electrophotography. And basically that what that means is that um, the body is given a very tiny little charge of electricity. And when the body receives a charge, it it's like a call and response. The body replies or responds in an ejection of plasma. It's a gas, a plasma gas. And within that gas, it contains light in a certain pattern. And what they discovered was that light emission is, is virtually synonymous or um, it's, it's replicating our own natural uh, light field. So, this forced emission technique um, is what the GDV, the, I'll talk about that in a minute, uses, and also the Curlian photography. So the GDV uses the 10 fingertips, but um, the Curlian photography, uh, for example, the Peter Mandel uh, people, they use the whole hand and the whole feet. Of course, it's really hard to do the whole body. And I do question that some of the curly and photography that's out there that um, claims to see the whole body, I, I don't really know if it's authentic, if it's really using this te technique. So the GDV camera, as I said, it stands for Gas Discharge Visualization. It's a camera that I've got. Um, I bought mine on eBay <laughs> about 10 years ago. And uh, so it was already used then. And nowadays they actually sell them and call them the BioWell camera. And I'm really glad I bought mine when I did because I was able to buy software and it was um, the software's mine and I'm completely autonomous. However, with the BioWell system, it's, it's by the same people. Um, you have to actually rent the software now and you also have to be connected to the internet to be able to do readings. So I don't have any of that. I'm um, independent and sovereign in that sense. So it was developed, this particular technique was developed by um, a Russian scientist, Koroktov, and it's been used in Russia uh, medically in hospitals and also for research. And it's been backed up by decades of uh, research to be able to correlate and make sure that it really is uh, reliable. 
and they did find a, a, a really high level of um, replication. Basically what they did, they studied a lot of people with different conditions and they correlated that to the different zones, you could say, on the fingertips. So it uses the 10 fingertips and it uses a system called Korean Sujok Reflex Acupuncture Points. So um, it all, all the information goes into a, co a computer software and it gives back information. I'll be showing you an example in the video soon. So when we're looking at the light field of our body, there's certain things that we want to look out for that indicates whether it's healthy, the healthy biofield, or not so healthy. First thing is the amount of symmetry, or we can also call symmetry uh, coherence. So it's a nice orderly, even type of pattern versus chaos. And chaos is, you know what chaos is. <laughs> And um, I just grabbed two examples um, from my readings over the years. And on the left-hand side, you can see that probably one of the highest levels of symmetry that I've found is 95%. There's a measurement that's given. And the lowest on the right-hand side is, uh, that I could find, although I actually think that I might have had even more chaotic ones than that, but uh, the reading there is 70%. So you can see the variation so the other, so I consider that the, the amount of coherence for the body is what is most important. But the other factor that we need to look at is how much light is the body emitting? Is there too little or is there too much? And you don't want either. But in this case, um, it's more common to see too little. I'll explain that. So I just grabbed, again, two examples. The one on the left is a young boy. He was 11 years old. And this was probably a couple of days after he had quite bad gut problems. And you can see that there's gaps in his biofield. Um, a lot of those gaps correlate with the digestive organs. There's the gallbladder. I um, can't remember what else there were, but at the pancreas. And there was also, curiously, there was... Um, the adrenal glands. So you can see there's gaps in there. So that's really probably not enough light. The one on the right is even less light. And this was a mother of four children. She always, whenever she came in, she was very stressed and very tired. And both of those things tends to diminish the amount of light that you can see in a field. This one, uh, I've just changed the filter. So th this actually represents the true image of the light coming from the body. Um, but this was a, a woman who had, uh, she was post-cancer actually from uh, having had it in the lungs. So I wanted to bring this up because sometimes there's too much light. And originally I used to always think, well, um, lots of light means health because I always used to think light means health, but in fact, it's not that at all. Um, I rarely see a person's body that's got all over too much light, but what I do see is um, flares, like solar flares coming from specific parts of the body. And when we have those flares, it's indicating that there's, um, it, it can indicate cancer or precancerous, but usually it's in, inflammatory, um, hyperactive, irritated, um, and sometimes pain. So it's something that's in its overactive state. So in this particular case, um, I just wanted to show you that this woman on the right side, she had a um, partial lung removal. She was already a couple of years past and she was doing really quite well she was in remission. However, you, you can see, I'm not sure if you can see that also on around the breast side um, in the, the shoulder areas, there's a, a messy, I call it messy, chaotic little section there. And that's what I'm talking about, this lack of coherence. So that's an area in her body that um, was unhealthy. And even though that flare was just above the actual lung area, it's very close. It was more in her throat area. And you can also see in her head area, she had some flares as well. And she did have a rather, I guess you would call a yang disposition, um, strong emotions. 
Okay, GDV in action. This is where I'm going to play you a little video. It's actually not that little. It goes for 14 minutes, but it's of me doing a session with somebody and um, it explains it quite well. So if you bear with me and I'll get that happening for you. So I'm just going to write in here uh, before the sensorial therapy. So we'll do a photo, actually we'll do two photos before and two after to do a comparison. Okay. I just need to explain to you how this works. Yes, please. So if you can see in here, here's the glass plate. It's, um, it's actually electrically conductive so there'll be a very minute charge that goes through the glass plate goes through your fingertips and then your fingertips respond with like a, um, a flare of light and that's what caption that's what we capture on camera so this is like a little dark room and what we're going to do is I'm going to photograph each um, of your fingers starting on your right thumb um, but before we do that, and then we'll work all the way through. So the idea is you get your um, fingertip actually on the glass plate. It doesn't have to be hard pressure, it's just very light pressure. Yeah, we just work, work our way through. So I'm going to start off with here. Put that on, and I'm also going to put this on, which is the... This keeps you grounded. It's the earth <laughs> because there is a slight little charge. So we we'll put that on. Excellent. Now, if you can take your thumb out and put your index finger in the next one. Ready to rock? Yeah. And now we'll change it to the middle finger. That's great. And. The ring finger. Awesome. Actually, that looks like that's not quite on properly. Let's just do that one again. You yep. still got the ring finger on? Let's yep. do that again. That's better. And the thumbs in there and sitting on the glass plate. Okay, we cover it up so it's really like a little dark photography room. <laughs> This is just a very fine filter that goes over the glass and it gives a different reading. I'll explain a bit later on uh, what that reading's about. Um, so we're going to do that and we're going to do one another set of photographs. So we're just going to repeat that once again. Beautiful. And the next one. The bluish ring zone is the optimal zone, mm. and the red or pink area within, if if one of these readings go into that zone, it means that that part of your body is under-functioning, hypo-functioning, or um, tired or weak, just, just not up to, to par. Mm. Um, if it goes into the yellow region, it means it's over-functioning, it's inflamed, irritated, or um, hyperactive. Um, bearing in mind this can change very quickly because it's energy filled rather than anything set in stone and energy changes very quickly. Mm -hmm. You can see the red, li red line and the blue line. The red line is um, without the filter okay. and the blue is with. And without the filter means that it's, it represents more your pure energy and your emotional state. Whereas with the filter, it's more your, it's getting closer to the physical, the physiological part of your body. So I immediately went to this, this one because it's, mm -hmm. <laughs> it goes in. <laughs> uh, that's the lumbar zone, which is the lower back. 
Mm, I don't know, you may or may not have issues with that part of your body because it's on the energy field and I, I know through the correlation of the emotional or either the, the TCM, the lower back can sometimes be financial, mm. support stress. It's not always physical, but it can relate to the more emotional aspect of that part of your body because it's curious because the blue line in the lumbar like the physical more well, the physiological physical part of your body is actually fine so i don't know if there's any signs of soreness or anything in your lower back or not no so okay. i have a uh, soreness in my upper back but not my lower Do you might be good okay this is interesting this is more middle back here so it's on the borderline there mm. that's interesting okay so I'm just going to do a quick scan. It's mm -hmm. pretty good. The phys physically, these two come out fairly large, which is throat and jaw and teeth area. Mm. You're laughing. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and it's the same also on this side with the throat. Um, so you don't have to divulge anything. You don't have to tell me at all. I think I hold, I think I hold a lot of stress in my jaw. Quite possibly, absolutely. There's so many people who do, and that is, I think, one of the reasons why I see throat and jaw areas, so, and also because of dental things I see so often that it's in that zone, it's in the hyperactive area in so many people. But yeah, tension in the jaw could easily do it. I won't go into this too much now, but let's just have a quick look at the um, energy field. So this is without the... Um, filter and this is with the filter. This is so amazing. So you can look for the dips and you can look for the flares. So we've got a dip here with which is gallbladder. Okay. Um, and again it may not be physical or, or, or it could be preceding like building up to a, a potential problem later and it may not actually be a physical problem at the moment actually because if you look at gallbladder over here where is it? There. It's not really depressed in, in the same way as it is here. Yeah. Um, but gallbladder, again, if you look for an association emotionally, mentally, gall is about having people with too much gallbladder, they, they can be bitter and really um, a lot of yang, a lot of fire. Mm. But if you don't, have much gall that could be the opposite that you don't have enough of that sort of because that's on a, a more on an um, emotional energy level because it's not showing up so much on the filtered one okay. and this one here that's the urinogenital area and in Russian they don't actually talk about the reproductive system as such but this is their terminology for the reproductive system so there may be a little bit of I don't know, it's always hard to interpret, but there's just a little bit of a dip there. Again, it's not showing up um, physically with the, the filter. This is a little bit, a little bit rough, I would say. It's just got just a bit uneven. Um, that's the nose, ear area. And again, it's energetic because over here it's not so much of a problem. Yeah. Just going to quickly look at the symmetry level, 93%, which is really good. And that says, I think that says 95%. Does that mean, what, what does that mean? Um, symmetry is like, you've heard of the word coherency, um, co yeah. coherent. If you can imagine if there's chaos or ripples and roughness on the ocean it means your energy field is is not optimally healthy in that area there's some disturbance you could say whereas if it's really nice and smooth and high coherence or symmetry it means it's like balance between the two sides it's nice and symmetrical and balanced it's a good sign of good health so 95, that is an amazing high level of coherency. 93 <laughs> is really good too. So you're in good shape, basically. <laughs> just quickly show the side view. Wow. There's that lower back right down in the coccyx, pelvis. 
So that's overactive. Yeah, there's a bit of a flare. So it could be, I mean, it could even be a previous fall on your buttocks and low-grade inflammation there, something that's not fully healed. I do have inflammation down here. Okay. Like in the okay. So that's that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably what that is. So that's the one that stands out the most. Except Ooh. here. Okay, you're talking about your upper back. Yeah. Okay, this is neck, middle, yeah, and lumbar. So that's looking a little bit rough, but more on the energetic field because on this, and it's more one-sided as well, on this side, the right side, whereas this side with the filter, more physical, it's not it's not coming up that much. So that to me indicates that it's not set in stone that you can make that changes pretty easily and well. Your body should be quite responsive because it's mostly on the energetic level at this stage. It's not yet gone to the physical. So I'm just going to show you one more thing before I get you into the sensora. This is amazing. It's interesting. This isn't is it? amazing. Mm -hmm. It's like seeing a physical validation for what I already feel energetically in my body. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? What a it picks up. Amazing. Again and again, I find that with people. It's, it's incredible. Um, this is a really good reading. <laughs> a really, really good reading. So yeah. it's going to be hard to see changes with the light therapy because it's always better to get people who are out of balance first. But <laughs> you're actually really in balance. Um, there's two things we look at. We look at the size of the energy of the balls and that's represented in this graph here so it should be within this blue zone which they all are and they're strong they're healthy got plenty of energy and then the other thing is the symmet symmetry or the lineup which you can see is is phenomenal and that's represented in that scale down there and the one that's most out is 0 0.05 which is virtually nothing which is the center um, chakra <laughs> So that's an amazing reading. We'll just save all that. And then let's do your sensora and we'll see how we go. So we're just going to do some more photos after the sensora now. Amazing. And you're all chilled out. <laughs> okay, we'll just do the same again. So it's on first. That's great, there's no filter there. Awesome. Okay. That's a load. It's always a surprise to me, I never know what, <laughs> what I'm going to find. So that's great, look at that. That lumbar zone, that's been corrected. Wow. Um, this has come out a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's on the edge, it's still okay. That's a good reading. Shall we just put on the filters and see physically? So blue was before with filters. Okay. And the brown is after. So the throat got better. I mean, they're pretty much similar. The rectum got better. <laughs> okay. And this one got better. The transverse colon, maybe it's about tension or something. This one got better, duodenum, and so it looks like your um, digestive system might have relaxed. That's good. That's pretty good. Let's have a quick look at the energy field. It's, it's very good, actually. Okay, so the top two are before. That's mm -hmm. without the filter, and that's with the filter. Mm -hmm. And this is after. Okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 so this was before you can see it's I mean they're both really good this was before which it was some of these with the teeniest little bit out and this is after which is like super perfect you can see the lineup wow your starting point was already so good but um, this is even better <laughs> like perfect basically. Mm -hmm. So um, 
just getting the slide back on. Okay, I hope you could hear that and I hope you could understand it. It was rather ad hoc, but it gives you an idea of um, what it's all about. So I'm just going to continue on now with some case examples. And for those of you who don't know what the Sensora is, I think most of you will know, but it's an incredible system, uh, sound and colour therapy system devised by Anadi Martel in Canada. And I've only recently got it happening in my space. And so I don't have a great number of people on it, but um, here's another boy, an 11-year-old boy who we put in there. And he only went in for 10 minutes he actually fell asleep during that 10 minutes. But you can see, once again, uh, the red line was before and the, I think it's a green line, is after. So there was some really depressed, well, I say depressed, um, the red line, there was a lot of lack of energy in certain areas, but it came out nicely afterwards. I'll show you another perspective. Um, this was his chakra reading. So you can see on the left-hand side was before. And after, you could see how that was improved. That was a, actually a really good improvement, just with 10 minutes. So I wanted to do show you a few with the monochrome dome. Um, this is one of my favourite colour therapy systems devised by Carl Ryberg in Sweden. I consider him a genius and I've had so many good results using his system. Um, so I dug up a few, uh, here's one, and on the left it's without filter, and remember without filter is more the emotional, energetic, it's the more pure energy, whereas with filter is more the um, tending towards the physiological aspect of the body. So before we had, um, in this case, already a, a quite a good reading as well, but we had the same symmetry, 94 before and 94 after. But with the filter, we had a 93 symmetry, which rose to 95% afterwards. And this was another another reading with the monochrome dome. Again, it's really quite difficult to get really significant um, view of changes if the person starts off already in a good state, which um, some of these people were. But you can see that the throat chakra was a little bit out and it came in nicely after the 10-minute session on the monochrome dome. And this one is also the monochrome dome a different person and we had as I well as I'll allude to a little bit later in another slide I don't always see what I expect <laughs> it doesn't lie basically this system so it's really good but we had some uh, more roughness and unusual um, changes in the energy field you can see that in these photos before and after however the symmetry was still reading at 91 percent for both So colour puncture, I just dug up one of these. I've got quite a few on record, quite a few photographs. This is probably um, the middle of the road type of reading. Um, generally, people do benefit. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a little bit of chaos and a little bit of dips. And then afterwards, it was more filled out. I wanted to mention, I, I didn't mention it before, that there's a really curious thing that Van Wick discovered um, in one of his research um, experiments with the natural emissions. One of the things they did is they shone a light, uh, a therapeutic light on the skin of a person and they observed what the, the photon emissions were doing during that time and then afterwards. And what they actually found was that the body went quiet with, with the photon emissions while it was being irradiated. And then if they took the photo straight after the irradiation on the skin, it was actually showed up uh, more quiet and depleted. But then slowly, slowly, the light would come back and grow. And I've often wondered about that. And I've, uh, I come back to the thought that possibly our body does absorb and 
emit light in cycles. And my thought was that in some of the color puncture or laser therapy, um, other therapies that actually uh, are applied on the skin, our body may go quiet and the light goes internal as we um, take it, store it and generate it on the inside. Anyway, I wanted to bring that up. Uh, it's a rather curious thing. It needs more research. So this, I mentioned a little bit earlier on, there was um, a very dynamic meditation with my teacher and that was called CNE, Consciousness and Energy Create Reality. We were in a situation in, in New South Wales where there were three of us, three students, and we decided to do an experiment. And I took the photo of one particular woman before doing this very strong dynamic meditation. And then I took the photograph afterwards. The meditation went probably for mm, 30 to 40 minutes, maybe it was quite long. And remember, there was a lot of breathing, um, very dynamic. But I wanted to show you this. She had a huge improvement after this. But the reason, the other reason why I wanted to show you this is that some people or can read quite a lot about the emotions through observing what the chakras are actually doing. Um, I have a friend who's an expert in the GDV in uh, Matt Shields in Victoria, and he claims that he can actually see when people are being dishonest with him, whether they're trustworthy, whether they're re reliable. And um, I wouldn't go so far to be able to say that I can do that, but I've learned a lot about people's uh, being able to read people's emotions through these uh, chakra readings. So I, I was just quickly going to show you a couple of things. For example, on the left-hand side, the left photograph, first thing that I do is I look for the really strong central chakras. And in this case, um, the first to third, seventh, uh, six and seventh are all very strong. This particular woman, she had an incredible ability, um, a connection with spirit. She was able to do amazing remote viewing, um, telepathy, um, amazing dreams. She just had a very strong connection with spirit. And so that was one of her saving graces. She also had a very strong mind, very strong focus. And you can see this, that um, Ajna uh, chakra, the one in the center of the forehead, was also is very strong. However, she had a problem expressing her truth, communicating her truth. That fifth chakra in the throat was, as you can see, it's really small and it's way off to the left. Now, there, there is significance to do with which side the, um, the ball or the chakra is placed on. That left side expresses or, or it shows, signifies that the person is, um, you could say, introvert in their expression of that part of their body. So they're, they're a submissive in that part. So this woman found it hard to ex express and talk, uh, bring out her, um, her voice to her, her truth. And the same with her heart chakra was way over the left. She had a lot of love energy, but she found it really difficult to express it. So, Afterwards, you can see how that changed. Actually, her heart chakra went right over to the other side. Um, and that may have had also something to do, to do with the strong breathing activity. But that was a really pleasing result. So let's just have a look at another one. This one here was a real surprise. I was just put it in here because um, we don't always see what we expect. Well, I don't anyway. <laughs> this was a gentleman, a friend of ours who came to stay with us and he had had cancer of the throat. You can actually see on the left-hand side, there's a little bit of roughness in that uh, throat region. He had had uh, chemo and radiotherapy. He was about a year past and in remission. And this was taken fairly early in the morning after a good sleep and after a good breakfast. And then we decided to go for a walk. And it was a walk through beautiful nature. It wasn't overly fast or anything like that, but we walked for about an hour and 20 minutes. And when we got back, he said he was fairly tired and I had planned already to photograph his um, after images. So I did that. And as you can see, there were huge gaps. That's a huge difference. And so 
it's not always the case that a big walk might be the best thing for us. And then I let, he, he rested for about 40 minutes and you can see the, the photograph on the far right. His, um, energy had partially recovered, not completely to the same degree as it was in the beginning, but it definitely had improved. So from that, I would have read, um, this particular gentleman would benefit more from rest and nutrition rather than lots of activity and, and getting out and about, which he tended to keep himself very busy. So that was an interesting reading. I just automatically thought, oh, a good long walk will charge him up and bring out more light, but um, it didn't. So that was an interesting one. So massage is the other thing that I like to do for people. And this was a woman um, also very stressed, middle-aged. She had a dependency problem on um, addictive substances. And you can see on the left-hand side, there's huge gaps in her field. And as I said before, that often happens, A, with stressed people, but B, also with tired or generally run down or deficient people. Um, she had both. And then after the massage on the right-hand side, we had a huge improvement. And that's generally been my experience that people seem to benefit greatly from the touch. And there's several reasons or several things that might be going on there. For example, her and my field are intermingled for a good hour or so. Um, the nourishment of being touched, there's a lot of reasons why massage might be so good. So you can see, though, in that right-hand side one, up near the head, it's still quite deficient. And she did have a lot of um, mental health issues. So that was interesting. Now, this gentleman came to me. He was in his late 40s. Um, I knew him fairly well. He did have strong mental health issues as well. And once again, I look for the strong points. He had an incredible mind. So that uh, chakra in his center of his forehead, the, where the thoughts originate, um, he, he was a, a mini genius in my mind. Um, yeah, he was very strong and very balanced, and that was one of his saving graces. He also had a very strong spiritual connection, and you can see that in the seventh chakra as well. And he had a lot of goodwill, a lot of love. And just look at that heart on the left-hand side, that photo. Um, he, yeah, that represents a really centered, strong reading, even though it wasn't particularly big. It was one of his saving graces. But on the right hand, sorry, that's still on the left photograph, um, we're looking down at the second and third chakras. I wanted to bring them up. Um, the second one, I translate that often to sexual issues. And he had a, um, he didn't have a partner. He was very needy. He really wanted a partner. Um, so that's very small and it's way off in the submissive zone, um, underactive. And then his third chakra. Now, the third one, I often read it into um, this. It's power or control versus um, victimization. So if it goes off to the left, often the person feels like they're a victim or they've been victimized. Um, if it's on the right hand side, they're more the controller. They want to control. So in this gentleman, he um, definitely f did have a lot of um, problems with feeling that life had it or people had it in for him. He was a victim. And um, so in any case, after the massage, that's all I did, just the massage. You can see that there was a big improvement. A lot of the energy increased and and. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention about him on the left hand side, you can see that little, the, the fifth chakra of the throat that's way off on the right hand side. And I had mentioned before, if it goes to the right hand side, it means that it's over active. And this, this man had such a problem with talking too much. He had a good case of verbal diarrhea. Um, it was very interesting what he'd say, but he could easily speak for an hour or more without letting anyone else speak. And um, so that was fascinating to see his little chakra in, in the fifth chakra way off on, on the right-hand side. So after the massage, as you can see, that came more to the centre. Um, the sexual one had come 
over to the other side and not that any of my massages are that way inclined but I think that a lot of people who are lonely in that sense just the physical touch has um, really healing benefit on them so I was really pleased with that reading So this is the, the little piece of controversy that I've wanted to include into the talk. Um, for a long time, I've often wondered what would um, one of these new vaccines, which is working on uh, more the RNA, the genetic, um, well, I won't go into it. Anyway, I had a client and he told me he was going to have a, um, a, va a jab soon, the vaccination. And I was really curious to see what might happen in the light field. So I asked him, would he mind if I did a, a reading before and after? And he was very willing, which was very nice. So the one, the two photographs on the left was taken two days before he had the Pfizer jab. And you can see that they're, they're quite good readings. There's a few gaps with the energy field, but generally it's quite a good reading. And then the second, the two on the right, two photographs were taken two days after the jab. Um, so in other words, four days later. And I had all the um, conditions the same. In other words, same place, same time of day. And when I saw that reading, particularly that one in the without the filter, I really questioned whether I had actually done something wrong because um, I don't think I've ever seen such unusual flares before. Um, but in any case, I proceeded. And when I did the one with the filter, which is on the far right, which is the more physical aspect of the body, the same pattern showed up in the same region. Um, and so what I would deduce from that, whatever's happening in the energy field is um, having an impact on the physical body, but not so much yet. Um, I don't want to read too much into it, but I know there's a lot of people who, um, or th there have been a lot of live blood microscopy uh tests done before and after some of the vaccinations just to see really how it's impacting the body and I found them fascinating so this bear in mind this is one gentleman one person he was by the way in his early 70s and um, really to get a, a decent idea I would need to do probably at least 30 people but I'm probably not going to do that uh, although he has very generously said um, I can take some more photos after his second shot, which will be in, um, actually it's coming up quite soon, but there's three weeks apart. So I'll be really curious to see what that um, shows as well. So very briefly, there's a lot of limitations and a lot of learning that can be done in this field. And uh, uh, yeah, I would really encourage anyone who's interested in, to to explore these. But as I said, energy fields change very quickly. Um, that can be a limitation. Um, forced emissions are not natural emissions, however. So we're still getting to know these Curlian forced emissions. However, there's a lot of data to show that they basically do reflect our natural biofield. So there's still a bit more work to be done there. Uh, as I said before, the times of day, there's changes in our emissions. That would be so wonderful to explore that a little bit more. It's thought that uh, the metabolism and the circadian rhythm might be linked to the amount of emissions during the day. So that's a whole area of exploration. And of course, I mentioned before that light on the body seems to do something strange to the emissions. Um, it seems to be almost like there's a, a, a time period of of absorption and so that's another area that uh, really needs to be explored a little bit more and deep meditation states or altered mind states also can often show the light going really internal so that there's less light actually being emitted and um, you've got to be a little bit careful with that because you can misinterpret that for um an unhealthy state. So there's so much to go into this area and I, I apologize for gone so long, but there's so much I wanted to share with you. Here's the resource page, which as I said, is available for all of you to, um, to take and to study more if you're interested. And I just wanted to finish off with a little quote. And that is, we are all 
pulsating transmitters and receivers of light, love and life. So thank you very much for listening and I'd be really delighted to answer any questions that you might have. We probably won't go too long because we've gone so long already. Um, but I'll um, exit this slide. And have we got Thelma on? Yes. Thank you <laughs> so much for this wonderful presentation. You have so much information to share. And I think it was very well done because they're not... Um, well, I haven't seen any questions coming, so you did a <laughs> fantastic job. Can we see the resource slides again, please? Uh, okay. You, that is one question. Do you want me to... Maybe, could you explain? Oh, yeah. There's, uh, Angela wants uh, to know, could you explain a little bit more how, to, how the full body pictures come from taking photos of the fingertips? Yes. Okay. So... You probably are aware that um, microcosm and macrocosm um, um, situations in our body, for example, the auricular acupuncture, there's points for the whole body, there's the feet. Well, there's a system of the fingers as well, where you could say the whole body is represented just in those fingertips. And it comes from the, um, the Korean Sujok acupuncture system, where they really studied um, all parts of the body just in the fingers and the hands so the Russians have used that system and they've translated that into actually I didn't show that but you can see finger by finger and the zones when you're doing a reading um, the zones that represent it in different parts of the body so yeah it's it's done in that method and then of course it's been validated by decades of research in the russians when they would find that there's an unusual sign in a certain part of the finger they would correlate that with um, the existing problems physical problems that that person had so it was um, backed up by that research i hope that answers that question Anything else? <laughs> uh, yes, I have a question from uh, Jennifer. Uh, how do the seasons impact uh, the energy fields? Okay, so I had um, read Van Wyck's works and it seems to be that it's somehow related to sun cycles and in autumn, I think that's when our body uh, emissions, light emissions become the highest and we're entering, it's almost as if we've absorbed lots through summer and we're at our peak in autumn and then we're going in for the winter. Um, I'm, that's what I read, but I think there's still more work to be done in that field. Um, but it, it seems to be very much correlated to external light stimulus influences how how our body um, how much it, it, it emits as emissions i hope that makes sense thank you i have another i have two questions from georgina she would love to see the photo um or the image uh, from the gentleman after the second jab okay do you want I'm me to go mind. back into slides uh, after the the photograph no, after of the, the second because he only had his first jab. Oh, I so see. So if he's getting his yes. second one, okay. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's an interesting. Um, yes, if you could um, maybe uh, get your email address to me, um, that would be good. I, I'm more than happy to share that with you. Yes. Okay, and uh, yep. yeah, and I think there there are no more questions. I can see. Um, you saw you've done a very good job. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry if I got carried away because it's it's an area of great interest, so I, I dived in deep. <laughs> yeah, but that shows, and, and that is always, always wonderful, you know, to tap into your enthusiasm and into your knowledge. 
So thank you so much for, for sharing it all with us. And uh, I'm sure that um, people who have any questions, they will, will, will find you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone who's come on the call. And thank you, Thelma. Lovely. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Oh, whatever. Oh, one second. Uh, Lynn is asking what area in the head was impacted after the first jab? Oh, okay. Yes, I didn't actually say that. So it was the left cerebral brain and also the um, throat region. And I, I didn't actually mention that too, that um, – he, I didn't know which side he had had the injection and he told me later on that it was the same side where those flares had appeared. Um, but uh, yeah, th there's a cerebral zone and, and it was the left cerebral zone that came up in the head. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. See you then.